welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends. And I have here with me today, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh, Landon. What are we talking about today? We're talking about my absolute favorite musical. Uh, I have a lot of favorite musicals, but this one is has a very special place in my heart because each song hits so hard and it's so real. We're talking about the last five years. Gosh, you guys, I hope you're excited. Um, this was a special stream that Landon especially asked for. Like, can we please watch this movie? I need to show you this movie. Um, and uh, it's one of her favorites. So I can't wait to tell you guys all about it and why you should watch it too. So I want to say welcome. Welcome in, Lunar. See that first Hi, there. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. So, uh, so yeah, if you like musicals, you should definitely watch The Last Five Years. We're going to talk all about it today, and I will tell you. So a couple of um, disclaimers first. This is not a spoiler-free podcast, as always. But I will tell you, even with spoilers, it's still good. So you can watch today with all the spoilers, and you can still go watch this movie, and I think get a lot out of it. I think, and I will talk about this in depth more, but I think what's beautiful about this musical is how simplistic the plot is and that the music really stands out because of that. And the way that the story is told is what makes this musical beautiful. So you can know the beginning, middle, and end. And I'll be honest, like I was just telling, literally right before we came on, I was telling Karen, I was like, the summary is so short because like not a lot of stuff happens. It's a character-driven, relationship-driven musical which I think is so rare in Broadway these days yes it really is so I want to show you guys the um the deck while I kind of talk about this next little introduction point I think that our audience um because a lot of our audience is uh you know text-based role players or people yes. that really like um RPG video games or D&D &D or things like that I know most of my people that watch regularly fall into at least one of those categories right and uh, and for this musical being a straight up romance, it's really just about two people. That's why I think that for you guys listening and watching today, you can still get so much out of it, even after we spoil it, basically, in yes. today's stream. Because I know you guys all like that kind of crap, because you wouldn't be um, into those things that I just listed if you weren't here for that like romance shipping type of stuff. And mm. that's really what this musical is. And I also think romance is not something we've necessarily talked about on this sh on the show before. We've talked about shipping and the relationships and dynamics, but we haven't actually talked about like breaking down what is romance and what isn't uh, and really looking at it and, and talking about like the rom-coms and everything that made so much of our growing up and the media that we consumed growing up so impactful because that's what was around in the early in the late 90s early 2000s was rom-coms every second of the day yep and we're gonna get we're gonna get more into that but I think I, before we kind of go to the next thing um I just want to say, like, I think you're totally right, because the only other time I can really think that we've talked about this sort of thing on stream is when we were breaking down Sailor Moon Crystal. <laughs> yes. That's about and it. Even then, and even then, I think it was very hyper-specific to the relationship of that, like, situation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily like, oh, the impact of romances within our media. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that we'll get to like talk about that a little bit more today. And it's something that I really think, especially knowing that we are working up to Hunger Games, uh, that's no yes. secret. And that a huge part of what made Hunger Games so popular rise was this forced love triangle upon it. Mm. I think that that's something that like is interesting to kind of taste before we dive in during that time. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so this stream is going to be a little bit... Uh, kind of whetting your appetite for that aspect of Hunger Games that we're going to talk yes. way more in detail about over several streams. And we're just um, going to be girly and talk about yeah. how much we love romance. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. This is this is the all femme stream. Sorry, um, male viewers. I I I, I have maybe you know five of you. <laughs> I still it's love still you, good. Though. This I musical still, love still you. hits. You can come back next week. <laughs> You can stay too. This musical still hits, uh, even it if does. it is it is directed towards a very certain niche audience. True, true, true. So. Okay, let's get into it. How, well, we want to start with the same thing we always start with. 
favorite things, right? Favorite things. So this is the last five years, a relatable musical. Uh, so Karen, what was your favorite thing? Okay, so it's a musical. So I have to tell you guys my favorite song. So there is this song where the um, the guy character of the couple is trying to cheer up his then I think girlfriend or fiance at the time. Um, yeah, they aren't okay. married yet. Yeah, they aren't they aren't married yet in this, but they are living together. And she has had a very hard day. And um, so he tells her this silly story. Um, and it's a song, of course, it's a musical, but. In reality, he's telling her a story, right, in, in their reality. And it's about this old man um, dressmaker who has a clock that can actually, like, manipulate time. And he is just, like, making up this story on the spot. It's like, oh, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. And it is the cutest fucking thing. And he's just trying to get her to smile and distract her a little bit. And I just found it as kind of like this incredibly relatable moment in romance when I think about like, you know, how do couples actually interact and try to cheer each other up? A lot of times we see this very like idealized version in a movie where it's like, you know, gifts and and uh, and very like uh, stoic type of affection and things like that. But he is very silly and I just looked at that and I was like, oh, I've had that interaction before. And I think that anybody who has been in any sort of long-term relationship could watch that scene and be taken immediately back to some previous memory. I don't know, unless you you are like, I guess, a very stoic person in your heart. But I don't think that's most people. I think most people no. have a silly side. So, uh, so I loved this song. I thought it was not only a really good song, but a moment that I was instantly like, oh, I've been there. And so that's why it was my favorite in the musical. Yeah, it adds, it also, given where it is in the musical, it adds so much levity. That is something that is beautiful about this musical. And we'll talk about like how it's structured and why that adds things, but it is so much like good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, that it keeps you on your emotional toes. And this is just such a moment where you're like, man, we're just been through an emotional thing. I empathize with Kathy. And here is this man who is literally just wanting to make her laugh and is running around just being funny and being goofy and telling a love story. And it is it is a magical moment. And, and of course, I took the screenshot of the most unflattering face. <laughs> Jeremy whole Jordan. But, but that's <laughs> but that's because that's what he looks like in this song. And, and yeah. he, he's he. I mean, he's adorable in several parts of the musical, but but this is his most attractive. This is his most attractive. And he's pulling these like stupid, goofy faces. It's great. I just love it. Um, it and that's saying something because a, pretty much all the songs in this musical are good. You know, yes. pretty much all of them. I there like, is not a bad most song. Musicals I'm prepared. Have... I'm prepared to say that. I don't yeah. think there's a song that I would cut. Actually, uh, the, no, because it's plot driven. There's a Kathy's that audition song where she's yeah. like, but like it's plot. It's not necessary. Yeah, I think that's the closest thing this musical has to what I would call a cellophane man song. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is like every musical has that one song that's kind of forgettable. It's um it's sung by a character uh that nobody really is that interested in. And um regardless of its impact on the plot, it could be cut and no one remembers it like cellophane man <laughs> um and that's probably that song that you're mentioning is probably the closest thing this musical has to a cellophane man yes. song. but even that like i still wouldn't cut that because it adds so much to kathy's character yes well and it's also like such a necessary part of the story the point in the storytelling where we're watching jamie have a lot of success and we're watching her cycle through over and over and over again not getting success and we'll go through the plot uh in a second just so you guys yeah. kind of understand what we're talking about but before we do landon what was your favorite thing again it's a musical so i gotta talk about my favorite song and that is the song i can do better than that this is such because we talked about how 
the thing that like we talked about when we were planning this episode was how relatable this musical is. And oh, look at the cats fighting behind you. It's very cute. <laughs> they're just, they're just, just playing. Just like, um, just like uh, Kathy and shoot, what's the dude's name? Jamie. Just like Jamie. Kathy and Jamie, um, the cats are fighting right now. The cats are fighting. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this is an incredibly relatable musical. And um, while I have always kind of related to Jamie more than I necessarily did Kathy. This song hit home to me in a way that I'm just like, man, this is this is my song. If you want to know me as a human being, I can do better than that is the song that it is. And it's it, it comes at this moment where Kathy is has just fallen in love with Jamie or is starting to fall in love with Jamie. And she's talking about where she grew up. And she's talking about that when she was, you know, 18, she graduated and her best friend got pregnant and uh, married her boyfriend out of high school. And Jane and Kathy looked around and realized that, like, that's not the life that I want. And because of that, she moved to New York City. She met a boy, a boy mistreated her. And she realized that, like, that's not the life that I want. And then all of a sudden, like, meeting Jamie, she's like, this is it. You are it. This is the life that I want. Um, But I'm going to continue to strive. I'm going to continue to sit there and say that I can do better than, than what I currently have. Uh, if I feel like I don't have enough. And that to me, I was just like, as someone who who very, very similar paths as Kathy in that regard, I was like, wow, this hits, this hits home and is a song that I just love and would love to belt to. <laughs> and poor Kathy, um, her entire like high school and, and, uh, and early adulthood, like college age and just out of college, like around that age, um, was such a struggle for her. She really yeah. had a lot of trouble um, getting her career started, and uh, then and she has a lot of romantic trouble, you know. But she's very attractive, so she finds people that are interested in her, either for her looks or her personality. But none of them are invested until yes. um, Jamie comes along. And uh, and that's basically what she's singing about is how like you know no I'm not gonna settle for somebody that's not a hundred percent interested in all of me right Mm -hmm. um and uh and i i think that's another point that's like ah haven't we all been there a moment at least everyone's at least had one relationship where you were like oh this person's only interested in this part they're not really interested in the whole me i i also think it's an interesting show of Kathy's character because this song comes near the end of the musical but at the beginning of Jamie and Kathy's relationship and we have seen Kathy give that up we have seen Kathy no longer believe that she can do better so like the knowing that this is where she started and it's somewhere along the line we watched her lose that and like that's a moment that you're like, holy shit! Didn't even realize that that's what's been leading up to, is that like that's what's been missing all along, is that she did one day, she did have it, and now she doesn't. And where did that go? And who did who was given that? And so it's let, a really beautiful part. Let's catch everyone up. So yes. Landon, could you explain the gimmick of this musical as well as the yes. outline of the plot? So this is another reason why this is a perfect musical uh, for Landon, because we start in an apartment in New York City, on probably one of the saddest songs on Broadway, uh, where Kathy is sitting alone in her living room, having just read a note from Janie that after a few years of marriage, Janie is leaving her. And um, it's like... Literally, the lyrics are, Jamie is over, Jamie is gone, and I'm still hurting. And she's been left behind by this man that she has poured everything into. So, all of a sudden, there is a switch. And we meet Jamie, a smiling young man who has just been handed the world, and we realize that this is five years earlier. So, we have seen Kathy in the previous scene five years after Jamie has been handed everything. And we realize that this is a love story being told from two different perspectives in two different ways of time. So we will follow this love story between Jamie and Kathy from these perspectives as we follow Kathy remembering 
her love story going back in time and Janie living it in the chronological way that it happened. Uh, and it's beautiful. We watch as Jamie talks about how much he loves Kathy, how much she has changed for, or how much of everything of his life has changed because of her, that she is the first one that he has actually felt confident and comfortable with and the girl that he actually wants to bring home to mom, even though mom would very much disapprove. And we watch Kathy struggle with Jamie's infidelity later on in their marriage. And we watch as these two trains of two different characters collide in the middle, at the very middle of the play, of a marriage scene where all of a sudden then we get the perspective change of Kathy reliving the early years of their relationship while Jamie lives the later years of their relationship. As Jamie watches their relationship and their marriage fall apart and Kathy relives how they fell in love. And it's really this beautiful gimmick of a very simple plot, boy meets girl, boy and girl falls in love, boy and girl gets married, boy and girl fall apart, but in a way that is cycled so that we see at the same time the beginning and the end of a relationship. It's so good. It's I it's love so a good, good gimmick and it sticks to it. It like sticks yes. to its gimmick where um, Jamie is starting from the beginning and moving forward in time and Kathy is starting at the end and moving back in time. And, and it's, it executes it every step of the way. And we are obviously watching the movie version, but the musical version does something very interesting where uh, there's a single item of clothing that Kathy wears. She wears a scarf. Jamie wears a hat. That if it is their scene, they are the one wearing that. The spotlight is put on them and the other character is in the background. Uh, some directors have chosen also that they never like cross over to the sides of the stage as well. In the movie... We don't see the other character talk during each flashback or flash forward. So when it is Jamie's turn, Kathy is there on screen interacting with him, but she's not really saying anything. She's just like- Very few lines. She has very few lines, or even if the lines that she is saying, there is no sound coming out. So you could see that she's talking to him, but there's no sound. We're not actually privy to her words. It's all through Jamie's experience. Same thing goes for uh, Jamie when it's Kathy's turn. We see this beautiful, one of my one of my other favorite songs uh, is I Can Do That, where Jamie and Kathy have just gotten married. They're at a party. Jamie is being celebrated because he's an author who's found instant success. And Kathy is like talking about how she's a part of his success because she's supporting him. And we're watching Jamie talk to all the people in the room while Kathy is basically being ignored, but she's the one who's speaking to us. So it really is this like, beautiful scene of like oh they stick to that gimmick uh and the only time that they both talk and both sing together is in the middle where they're getting married and at the end where jamie is watching himself like as a memory watching himself fall in love with kathy but also leaving her and kathy is watching herself fall in love with jamie after being left yeah it's really really um heartbreaking at the end mm -hmm. and uh and we're gonna we're gonna next talk a little bit about the industry and the environment um around this particular musical but I can't wait to get back to the characters because yes. they are both so compelling and there's so much more about them that I can't wait to share with you um but first let's talk about the industry and everything that was going on so the play began in 2001 mm -hmm. all right um, and it, that's when it was kind of like in its heyday, like being produced or whatever, right? It's by yes. a man named Jason Robert Brown, which mm -hmm. I took a look and um, he hasn't really made much else. <laughs> um, but I thought it was very interesting that what he feels inspired by is something like, um, you know, Sunday in the Park, uh, where uh, where it's about... Uh, how do you love a successful artist, right? Which is a lot of what the musical is about. Now, the movie came out in 2014, all right? So if you think about what was going on in between 2001 and 2014, that was like the era of rom-coms, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could go to the video store because yes, we still had those back then. They weren't around for much longer, but we did still have them. 
And almost every week, there was a new rom-com that was just coming out on DVD that you could rent. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and it was great. It was great. Uh, it was fantastic. Yeah. Actually, fun little offside. My sister and I, we just went on a cruise over Christmas. And it was nightly ritual that we would watch a rom, some of these early 2000 rom-coms and drink hot chocolate at night together. And I was like, man... These early, I forgot how often things like 27 Dresses and, uh, the, you know, Made in Manhattan and all of these like silly, cheap rom-com movies of just feel good, get laughs, boy and girl meet and fall in love constantly came out and how that has, that's not around anymore. The last, like, I'm thinking, it wasn't there just a uh, J-Lo and... Oh my God, McConaughey! I think Who rom com that nobody. tried to came off. Nobody watched it. Yeah. Uh, I the last rom com that I can think of that I watched and loved was Crazy Rich Asians, and that was in 2019. Yeah. Right. Like. <laughs> so you're probably thinking, like, oh, why have I never heard of this movie? It sounds yeah. great. Well, it came out in 2014, and by the time 2014 came around, video stores weren't really a thing anymore. It was all streaming. And rom-coms, they don't make money at the box office. They never did. The reason why people were producing rom-coms was for the secondary market. It was for money that they were making off of video and DVD sales and rentals, all right? So by 2014, when video stores really weren't a thing anymore and everyone had Netflix or whatever, um, rom-coms really kind of stopped making money and they stopped being promoted. So... This movie came out based on a very popular musical, and unless you were, like, super deep into musicals, I guarantee you had no idea, um, yeah. because it kind of just slipped in there, and it, it's not a big budget musical, so it really didn't have any advertising, and then it was just released on streaming platforms, and that's it. Unless you got it in your recommendations for, yeah. for your uh, streaming algorithm, you never heard about it. And this is around the same time that Pitch Perfect came out. So mm -hmm. Anna Kendrick hadn't found major success yet. Uh, she certainly was a known name, but she, like people, she wasn't, she wasn't a title to bring to the box office. And this was prior to Jeremy Jordan being on Newsies. So he too, while very, very famous in the Broadway circle, was not known in the industry as a whole so we have these two for lack of a better term indie actors in a very indie movie of a musical that has no large hit songs that has no large uh cast and dance parties and dance numbers that really really focus on a very simplistic plot that was dying in the media's eyes it it wasn't set up to fail because I think it was successful for what it was, but it certainly was never going to be a hit. Um, Unfortunately not. And it kind of died out. Like so did the movie and so did yeah. the plot. And so did the, uh, so did the musical afterwards. It's yeah. still, it's still currently being shown, but it's not being shown anywhere near in the United States. The last showing was in 2019 in uh, Syracuse, New York and 2018 in Dallas, Texas. And prior to that, it had several years of not being around in the United States. Uh, and 2013 was the last time that the, uh, there was an off-Broadway revival of it. So um, I imagine that as far as like big musicals go, this must be one of the cheaper ones. So community <laughs> theater um, organizers or people looking for a good play for a smaller high school, um, take a look at the last five years. I don't know how much the but rights then, are, but I, I feel like they can't be much. <laughs> but even then, I disagree with you because it is so small. It's never going to be successful in those things because oh, no. like literally yeah. our cast is too... Our speaking cast is two, maybe three characters. Tiny. It's tiny, tiny. It's tiny. So as far as community theater, it's never going to be that. It certainly will never be uh, any sort of high school or any sort of program where you have worlds of more kids. Um, maybe on a student-directed, like, hey, if you were in high school and you're having a student-directed project, this might be it. But it's so <laughs> small. It's so small. So like, and here's the, the other sad thing is um as of this month it's not on streaming services anymore either so so uh so be so i would say be on the lookout for when it comes back 
and definitely watch it. I'm sure it will cycle back around. Um, but uh, but we had to we had to watch it other ways because it was not and it was okay. It was in 2022. It was it like in, in, and in December. We checked yeah. in December <laughs> and it was there and then it wasn't there. Um, it was just so sad January. because I have to go buy it because this is one of my comfort movies, which is sad because it's a pretty depressing musical. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but this one's really good. I think it deserves your attention. If you are a mm-hmm. musical fan, even if you're not um, a super big rom-com fan, I think it still deserves your attention. And if you're a rom-com fan, oh, my God, it's a must-see. It's it is a, must-see. a must-see. And I think that, like, this really speaks to, again, just trying to focus on, like, the idea of rom-coms in the industry of, like, just a dying, a dying genre. I don't think we realize how – because – trends happen before our eyes and we participate in them it's interesting when we're hit with such a like trend that feels uh, like part of us to realize that it no longer exists Mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of like you know the 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 idea of skinny jeans skinny jeans were such a big thing in the early 2010s and now they're like so out of style but like us 2010s people are holding on to our skinny jeans like they're going to come back at some point. Uh, <laughs> and so rom-coms are very similar to that of like, oh, there used to be such a niche in the media and such a niche in the industry where you could have a plot line of like two, a meet cue of two people falling in love and it be a success enough to make money. And now that doesn't exist. You have to have more than that. We are requiring more from our media than just two people falling in love in a cute situation and having miscommunication. And I don't see it coming back, to be honest. Like the only way it could come back is if they totally changed the pricing and monetization structure of streaming. Because right now, the movie producing companies they simply don't make enough money on streaming residuals to um to justify something that has a more niche audience they they can only really make um four quadrant movies if it's not a four quadrant movie it's not going to be worth the investment unfortunately that is simply um the case of the market so this was probably one of the last like really good rom-com movies to mm-hmm. be produced period and, yeah. and until the industry has another big shift again, I don't see it coming back. I just don't. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like Westerns. Westerns aren't popular anymore, and, and I don't see them coming back. We maybe get one Western a decade. Rom-coms, I feel like they're the same way. Like, I don't think they're coming back. No, I, I agree. I don't think that they're, I don't think there's space for them anymore. I also mm-hmm. think that that has to do with, like, the industry itself really putting a foul taste in our mouth as far as, like, <sighs> The writing, because they were successful, got so lazy with what the stories were. Oh, God. Uh, so obviously, many bad rom-coms. <laughs> not even, like, talking, obviously, talking beyond uh, last five years, but talking about, like, oh, my God, there's the one with Jennifer Aniston and What's-His-Face where they have a one-night stand to get pregnant and then, like, are going to You mean every up. single Jennifer Aniston <laughs> rom-com? I can't think of a single right. one I like. I'm you're sorry, right. Jennifer. I'm you're sure right. you're a lovely person in real life. But no. um, that would be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, but no, yeah. it, 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 and like the, the, it got so lazy. There was nothing inventive or new about it that by the time, like people were like, oh, we've seen this before they stopped completely making money that didn't even have necessarily to do with the streaming. It also had to do with the quality of work. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, there is a no-go on any rom-com because we know that doesn't make money. But if you wrote like a decent rom-com, then it might it might be big because I like mean... thinking of Crazy Rich Asians, it was obviously successful. It, I wouldn't necessarily call it rom-com, but it is a romance movie. Um, it, it was successful, but that's because it's not just solely fa- fa- focused on the rom-com. Mm-hmm. It's not just solely fa- focused on how a woman can change for a man. It's because it changed with the times. And it is so funny you keep bringing up that movie, and I keep trying to think of like, it's such oh, a good what's movie. another one I could bring up? <laughs> there isn't there literally one. <laughs> isn't not in the last decade. That really is the only not, one. <laughs> not that like, because I'm like thinking of I'm a huge rom com fan, uh, and and I have like I attach to niche 
movies as like comfort movies and I'm like the only other one that's like coming to mind is the intern and the intern isn't even a rom-com the intern is not a rom-com it's not a (laughs) rom-com at all (laughs) it's a friendship com if anything yeah yeah I would Um, not call that a rom-com if anything that's more like a a buddy movie if anything and thinking of the big like romance centric things that have existed uh, in the media in the last decade, we're thinking of on a larger scale, we're thinking of like fantasy romances. Yeah. Um, uh, thinking of like things like, you know, Twilight, Hunger Games, all those things made a big splash, but all of those, again, are not rom com material. They're more like rom- romance dramas. Yes, it's dramas. Mm -hmm. Um, And then because also like this change in streaming that TV has become episodic, how storytelling has become more relevant than movie uh, storytelling. Even those aren't rom-com they're more drama based. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't, I'm trying to think of like the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, yeah would be a rom-com um but again that started in 2016 um and all the movies that are coming all the shows that are coming to mind excellent show by the way if you've never watched crazy ex-girlfriend all of the movies that are coming to or all the shows that are coming to mind all started in those mid-teen eras Mm -hmm. because i'm like thinking ugly betty i'm thinking of like all like that's an old one but also an excellent show um yeah, I yeah, the newer I comedies. The Emily newer in comedies Paris, I've watched, I guess you can consider. They're not consider, romances. I guess Emily in Paris, you can consider a romance, but like it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I only ever, I only ever watched the beginning of the first season. I was like, I, don't I know watched. Why yeah, the show I watched like, I the first three episodes. <laughs> no one liked the. Ep- That's the whole thing with Emily in Paris is no one liked it, but enough people hate watched it that it got greenlit for I guess, three seasons I, I think i made it through three episodes before i was like this isn't worth my time so yeah, no i made it through like an episode and a half i was like okay i can't stand this so yeah okay. no i think that the industry has completely has completely changed but that's what makes this feel so nostalgic yeah yeah which i think goes into like why we love this musical exactly so let's break it down so now that we've got the stage set and you you know kind of what was going on why is this music so lovable so we both find this musical incredibly relatable. And I think yes. that the movie version definitely knows how relatable it is because it even pulls you in instantly. Like the it starts out, as Landon told you guys, with a really sad song. But the other thing is that the first couple of notes um, are from somebody playing piano in their apartment. Now, it's not like a named character or anything. It's just someone playing piano. And then that music be- is is diegetic and throughout the rest of the musical there never is another moment where the music becomes diegetic but it doesn't need to be because the second you're pulled in to Kathy's like sad song about Jamie leaving her you don't need it anymore like you're in like this musical has a- an amazing opening scene that just like sucks you in instantly and uh, and at that moment you are along for the ride for the whole rest of it. It's just excellent in that way. Yes. I also think it's plot itself, like not even about the love story of it all, but the plot of, if you want to break down the plot as simple as possible, it's two people who outgrow each other. And I think every single person in the world has experienced growing out of a relationship whether it be a romantic or friendship or anything like that that you start out so close and so bonded and then find yourself in an area where you don't understand how it fell apart um and that is an incredibly relatable story that really speaks to like the young adulthood existence um and i think because of that you can empathize with either character at any given point all of these songs, even if you're like, man, I can't stand that Jamie has infidelity issues, that he's cheated, that he's an asshole. You can be inside his brain, think all of those things and still relate to the songs that he's saying, that he's still relating to the frustration that like, Kathy, I love you. Why can't you just see that? Uh, or the uh, the frustration of being like, hey, you had a bad day, so I'm going to try to cheer you up, but that's not working. Like and all of those things. I think we've all had somebody that like, maybe grew faster or slower 
than us. Um, I know I've experienced it both ways where all of a sudden, you know, um, I'm back here and somebody that I used to relate a lot to has, is now in this other stage of their life. And it's like, oh, I don't relate to that anymore or vice versa. I've definitely been the one to leave a friend behind. And it's very, very sad when that happens. And like, you want your friends to grow with you, but that's simply not always possible. It's simply not. And even if you've not experienced it in a romantic relationship, I agree. I think everyone has experienced it in a friendship relationship. Like, um, you know, you look back at your Facebook feed. Well, I, I haven't browsed Facebook in, in a couple of years, but this used to happen when I did. I would browse Facebook to see like my friends that I grew up with, like my high school and middle school friends and stuff. And um, and some of them were not doing good, like not doing good, you know, and I think we've all had that experience where we're like, oh, my gosh, what the heck happened to her? She was in honors classes and things. What happened? Um, yeah. And and that's kind of what happens to to poor Jamie and Kathy in this musical. They they grow at different rates and they can no longer relate to each other. And we have all experienced that. Yes. And I think that's actually something incredibly unique that like, and we'll talk about Kathy's character in a bit, but like that Kathy experiences too, of we see this song of I can do better than that, which is all about that idea of growth. I am going to outgrow and I have already outgrew the people in which that I grew up with. I grew so fast. I needed to get out of that city and I needed to come to a big city. And then I meet somebody who grows faster than me and I don't grow at the same rate. Like that in itself too is an incredibly related, li- relatable experience of like, oh, I'm headed in a direction. And then all of a sudden that direction doesn't feel as fast anymore. And or you know that it's direction. Relatable? You know, it's relatable because as you're talking, I'm thinking of like, oh, this mutual friend or oh, that mutual friend or yeah. that mutual ex friend. <laughs> yes, Exactly. <laughs> Um, or, or myself, there were certainly aspects of parts and times of me where I was like, I got to go forward. I got to do this thing. And then the goal that I wanted for reasons of my own making and reasons of the universe's making didn't happen the way that I wanted it to. And that was stunted growth. Like, so, so not only is the relationship and the dynamic between two incredibly realistic characters relatable, but so are the characters themselves. Jamie, Jamie has instant success, which I'm sure all of us wish we had, but there are points in times in which we did. (laughs) There are points in time in which it was like, oh, this goal, this thing that might've been a goal for somebody else who had been striving for was just handed to us. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I got handed this thing and now I'm being praised and rewarded for this thing. And the people around me that I love so dearly are jealous of it are are angry with me because of it and it could be something as simple as like I mean I I had friends who were frustrated at the fact that I was able to get a house during an an incredibly stressful time in the housing market not even because like I was able to afford one but because like the market was so competitive that I just happened to like put it in on the right house while they're struggling to find a house to put one in that they're not getting rejected on at the end of the day you got lucky (laughs) I got lucky like Mm -hmm. that that level of and so have you watcher Mm -hmm. so have you Karen Mm -hmm. as far as like that there are times where you've got lucky and people have been bitter about that. And that in itself is relatable. So not only do we have all these relatable songs, these musics, but we also have this relatable relationship, these relatable characters. It just feels real. And, and I think um, it's so... Go ahead. And the other thing that's like super lovable about this musical, and I'm not trying to rag on Mr. Newsy nope. Sky, okay? But Anna Kendrick is amazing, okay? She out acts him like crazy. Like if you watched this movie before she blew up with Pitch Perfect, you would know like this woman is going places because she is so compelling in this musical, even though I kind of agree with Landon. We'll talk about this in a moment. I definitely relate more to Jamie. But every time Anna Kendrick is on that screen, I'm like, yeah, girl. Yeah, you say it. You get you get it. it. Yes. She's so good. She's so good. (laughs) She is very good. I love Jeremy Jordan too. I think Jeremy Jordan was the perfect person to play this character. Uh, but I definitely think that you could tell the difference between who is more comfortable being on screen as an actor and who is more comfortable being on stage as an actor. And Jeremy Jordan is a stage actor. Uh, yeah, the camera it, loves it, Anna Kendrick. Loves her. Yes. 
And I think that that just comes to experience, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think that if they were both on stage, however, Jeremy would kill this. Probably. In a way that, in a way that Anna might not have been able to. Who knows? Yeah. But right now, <laughs> as far as this goes, I, I, I think that there is something just so simplistic about it, too. There is no crazy plot here. There is no out of this world thing. I think every single person can put themselves in either character's shoes and feel like this is a life that could be lived. And that's not true with so many rom-coms. Like, I think that that's also why this is unique beyond the rom-com because that's not true when I'm thinking of like, any Patrick Dempsey sort of rom-com. I'm like, <laughs> no, there. I as much as I would love the meet cute of a coffee shop, that's not how the world exists anymore. Right. The yeah. dating, uh, the dating apps, which is kind of how they met, um, in the in the movie at least. Uh, the dating app game of like, oh, I'm meeting all these people, and then all of a sudden I find the right one. <laughs> that is a relatable experience for most people at this point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how it goes in the 20 in the in the play version, because I will say the movie, because it came out in 2014, they did update a couple of things. So the yes. movie has some ever so slight differences um, like that that really just, you know, get it up to date. <laughs> I have a feeling it's it's pretty similar as far as like probably um, you, a friend or whatever they met mm-hmm. that way. But I mean, he, she met her first college boyfriend in in class Mm -hmm. like that's so it's like all those natural things of like it wasn't this outrageous plot that like i wish i was living this is the life that i could live no sparkly vampires in sight no sparkly (laughs) vampires in sight no need to be a news no no enemies to lovers as much as i love enemies to lovers Mm -hmm. no outrageous trauma bonding happening just two people finding each other and and being there for each other And that's really why, like, I keep saying it, but I think it's true. That's really why I think most people could get something out of this musical. And I really Mm -hmm. think everyone should watch it. Like, not not just if you uh, like musicals or just if you like rom-coms, you know. If you you never watched either of those that you like, I think you have something out of this. And I think what makes this so incredibly important is how the story is told like it's not the story being told that makes this a unique i think that if the story was told from back to front um the story would be people will not be interested in as much in it i think what makes it lovable is that it is the tale of two people who have competing point of views and the story is told in two different directions yeah well because for kathy the best time in her life was in the past and for jamie his best time is coming so they they go in the other directions so yeah but yeah no before we can we get we can to that on. yeah because we're going to talk about that but before we talk about that we got some audible recommendations oh my gosh you guys um so if you uh do not have audible i highly recommend it this is, i actually use this service and interstage window is sponsored by audible as we are every time we do one of these podcast episodes and you can get a 30-day free trial on Audible by using our link, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. Um, and for that 30-day trial, you get a free audiobook. And if you are just as excited as I am to dive into Hunger Games this year, I highly recommend signing up for Audible using our link and downloading the first Hunger Games book so you can read it with us before we have our Hunger Games episode in, there'll be March, okay? Yes. So do it today, get started today so that you can join with us. Um, but we also always have our audible recommendation. Maybe you already have Hunger Games. Maybe you already have. So Landon, what do you recommend um, on Audible for today? Well, I'm actually going to recommend a book that uh, I just finished reading on Audible. Um, and it's amazing. If you like, you know, I also figured that this is the most realistic, most contemporary uh, media episode that we've done. So in order mm. to like do that, I wanted to uh, I wanted to honor that with having a autobiography, a nonfiction autobiography as our audible recommendation. So also, uh, this story is messy, full of 
tea spilling inner thoughts. So I figured an autobiography would be perfect for that too. So if you have not heard of this tiny little book that has been dropped last Tuesday called Spare by Prince Henry, Harry himself, I keep calling him Prince Henry, uh, Prince Harry himself, uh, it is a fantastic book. Uh, It is the, of course, the Prince of Wales, uh, Prince Henry, Harry, oh my god, I promise I know his name, uh, (laughs) from England, and his whole life story up from when his mother died, Princess Diana died in 1997, and up until uh, something as soon as his grandmother's funeral uh, this past year. And all the things that happened in between, there is much tea to spill. There is much drama. There is a lot of miscommunication and people outgrowing each other and the institution unwilling to change and also people within it unwilling to change. And of course, at the core of the story, it's a love story. So I figured if you like the last five years, you'll also like Spare. Uh, And he reads it himself. Which is awesome if you want to listen to a, Br- a British prince read his trauma to you. So I have not it, read it myself yet, but I've read all the press releases and I am riveted. So and I gotta, I, <laughs> I gotta pick it up because like everyone's reading it and talking about it, and um, and I am fascinated. And so I yeah. just, you know, I, <laughs> I feel so like he good. might he might sympathize with me on this point. But you guys know that like um, you're probably gonna have another monarch pass away very soon. So UK, I would just like to tell you. You know, you can just not do the coronation for the next one. You don't have to do this anymore. It's Fine. it's okay. It's okay. Um, it's okay. You, you don't have to. No, I will say that that is like the one thing that uh, I I will for, you know, we like to run a little bit of a leftist podcast here sometimes. Uh, it, this is not an anti-monarchist book. I will just say that right there. Uh, Prince Henry, Harry and all of his wonderful therapy glory has yet to find that the institution in which he was born into is a incredibly damaging uh, part of history. He he does not really acknowledge that in this book. However, I wouldn't <laughs> there are expect other... him to. <laughs> I wouldn't expect him to either. Uh, that seems like a that seems like a bomb that just is too much for right now. Uh, maybe <laughs> when his father dies. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I'm just saying, I'm just saying like, hey, UK, you don't have yeah. to do it. You had a chance. You you screwed also, it up. <laughs> but you, you have another one soon, I'm sure. Without spoilers, <laughs> this story <laughs> makes his father look like a better king than his brother would be. No, so like, stop it. I don't believe you. Okay, well, I have to read gotta it. Gotta read now. it. You I gotta read, read it. it. Okay, I have to read it. So that's our Audible recommendation. You can try sign up again um, on audibletrial.com slash interstage window. Uh, and this is one of those things that like, it's a service that I use. So I do like recommend it in general. So yes, here we go. Fantastic. And thank you so much for sponsoring today. Um, Audible, we love you. Thanks, Audible. All right, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Okay. The tale of two people. So, so because sad. we have got this gimmick of Kathy going back in time and Jamie going forward in time, we have a competing point of view yeah i also think that like you said as far as like jamie's best days are to come well kathy's are best behind her i think that that's true ish but i also think that there's a level of like grief that is shown in this point of view jamie is at the end so he's lived through all of it he's grieved through all of it and so that was told in order he's processed all of it he is done with his story whereas Kathy is now clinging as hard as she can onto what has happened, which is why we go backwards with her. So it's not only like, oh, the best is behind me and the best is in my future, but a huge part of it is I have let this go and I am holding on. And when you, when it first starts, the first thing you see is Kathy with her like sad song and she's reading this breakup letter that Jamie has written her. And I really felt like, oh my God, this jerk, what the (laughs) heck, Jamie? Um, You know, how can you say that? Because one of the things he says in his letter is like, it's not about more therapy. It's not Mm -hmm. about more therapy, but clearly like the implication being Kathy wants to keep going to therapy and Jamie's like, I'm over it. We're not, no more therapy. It's not helping. Well, that's because 
Jamie has processed it and Kathy has not. By the end, okay, Jamie, yes, you're right. Therapy's not going to help. And you're right. You you guys do have to break up. Like, I get it. But at the beginning, I was like, wow, that's a really mean breakup letter. How can you say that? Well, you watch the musical and you find out how he can say that. (laughs) It turns out they've been to therapy a lot. (laughs) And it hasn't worked. (laughs) Well, and he's right. And And it's because these two are at a point. Yeah. where they they can't they can't relate to each other anymore. So just to kind of like explain exactly what happens and why we're saying that. So Jamie's instant success, he is a writer and he is picked up by a publisher um at age like 23, 24, something mm-hmm. like that. Um at the very beginning and and his book is a massive hit and yeah, best selling um, novelist. Yeah, bestseller like and and so he's like he's a very popular author. Award winner. Everyone, yep, everyone loves him. His publishing house loves him. You know, all this stuff. Kathy is a um an actress and a seamstress. These are her two kind of like artistic pursuits. Neither of which work out throughout the whole musical. Unfortunately, the only place that she can get work is at this like um, very low level um, summer production house that puts on plays every summer in Ohio. Um, and uh, and so she goes there and she works every summer, but that is her only, that's her only work. You know, she tries to, to get jobs elsewhere throughout the rest of the year. She tries with um, selling her dresses and patterns and things like that. None of it works. None of well, it works at all. And there are hints that she is working, like mm-hmm. that she does get jobs. Uh, but the consistency is the summer in Ohio. Yep. And she has not, and she's constantly comparing her success to Jamie's. Jamie, who instantly got it, didn't have to necessarily go through all the work of struggling for success. He was just handed it, yep. according to her. Um. And so like that bitterness that exists, that insecurity that exists in that relationship really like makes a turbulent foundation because while Jamie at the beginning of the relationship and at the beginning of his success doesn't let it go to his head, uh, she is still bitter about it. She's still angry about it and she's still trying to convince herself, well, I'm a part of that. I get to see it happen. I get to see, I get to be a part of the inspiration. I get, I get the stories. I get the, the moments where he's trying to cheer me up. Uh, But at the end of the day, that's not enough for either of them. She wants the success. She wants, she wants something that's more stable. She wants to be famous. She wants to be considered good at her craft, not just mediocre, but that doesn't happen for her. She's considered just, you know, average at best and yeah. um and she and, can't she can't handle that and it's important like to note not to be like team jamie on all this but well, we're gonna jamie, debate that we're gonna debate it in a second but yeah. jamie does like acknowledge that does yeah. acknowledge that uh she doesn't have it but and that she's frustrated by that but like there's even a song, one of my favorite, favorite lines of the whole musical is, I will not fail so you can be comfortable, Kathy. I can't lose. I will not lose because you can't win. Uh, and it is this, like, underlining reason of the reason why the relationship wasn't working is because she didn't want him to be successful because she wasn't. Uh, and that's a hard, that's a hard position to put your significant other into. Um, so it really is like a story of subtlety because so much of this is told. We are, we are starting the story with Jamie as the villain and then right off the bat, find out that Jamie's been cheating Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also like have a song in which Jamie is not, when we see Jamie's first song, um, he's not making a great case for himself. No, <laughs> this man is 23 years old and he goes through describing all of his previous relationships. Somehow by 23, he has had 12 serious girlfriends. That man is the fastest serial mo- monogamist Monogamous, I have yeah. ever seen. No, the he heck? dated a set of twins. Like, like just no bueno. 
no good so like he obviously uh is not so like he's not set up to have to be like the hero of the story he is set up in the first three songs to be the villain because we find out he's left we find out that he is a serial monogamist and we find out that he cheated Mm -hmm. uh and that he seems to be emotionally cut off from this relationship Mm -hmm. and then we watch the rest of the show and it's all again subtlety of like these small little lines and small little moments of like oh the flaws in in kathy's character are these pauses are these small insecurities rather than anything big happening and we we get uh, it told through um through Kathy we we get it told through her art so this doesn't really happen yeah. as much with Jamie we don't really learn a whole lot about like what type of writing he does or what genre or whatever but for Kathy we f- see every summer what play that she is doing so i'm going to give you three examples one of the very first ones that we hear about is Les Mis and what is Les Mis if not a tragic romance? And, and again, that's the first one that she is in. She's we don't we don't learn too much about it, but she's part of this Les Mis production, and she's miserable. And that's at the end of her. So that's again because timelines are confusing. So that's at the end of the relationship mm-hmm. that we find out she is in Les Mis. Tra- mm-hmm. And and the story behind the romance story behind Les Mis, in case you don't know, is uh, an unrequited love story. Where Fatima feels as if she is she has fallen in love with this man, this soldier, who has fallen in love with somebody else. And no matter how hard she tries, this man won't notice her. This man can't, like, even though she is willing to die for him, uh, he takes advantage of that. And so that's how she feels. Yeah. Is that Jamie is taking advantage of her love. Yep. And then um, towards the middle... One of the things that she talks about is that she's part of a production of Porgy. Well, what's the plot of Porgy? In Porgy, it's all about this guy coming in and trying to save this woman from an abusive relationship. So she is starting to feel like very put upon, very like, I need to be saved from this relationship. And and she believes at that point that her save being saved from the relationship is going to be you know finding acting work actually in new york instead of having to continue mm-hmm. to go back to ohio um, and also and shown some, through talking about porgy and in some ways also i think thinking jamie will also be the hero mm-hmm. because at this point in time we're also seeing jamie do a lot of the legwork we're seeing not only J- like this is the time where that song uh the, Sh- the shamuel song comes in yep. where jamie is trying to cheer her up where she is failing these auditions where they are getting married so there is still that like idea of being like oh i am in, not in a healthy relationship but i'm expecting my partner to come in and save me i'm also expecting the success to come and save me um if only i can be on that same level Mm -hmm. she just keeps thinking it's all going to fall into place soon it's all going to fall into place because she has these conversations with her agent as well where she's very hopeful like she thinks oh it's it's right around the corner it's about to work out for me like it's it's going to happen any day now and her agent seems to be we don't hear the agent but seems to be like very positive towards her thinking that yes it's going to work out really soon um and then and poor poor thing as we know because we're going backwards in time it doesn't (laughs) it does not yeah um and Um, then that first summer mm -hmm. she's doing west side story Mm -hmm. which again tragic romance of boy and girl from separate sides separate sides of success yeah but she oh the character she's playing um i can't remember the character's name but it's the girl that comes over to the U.S. Like she follows her Puerto Rican boyfriend mm-hmm. to the U.S. Puerto Rican boyfriend is not not around anymore. He dies, right? Uh, who, well, I can't remember what character it is. But anyways, if you've seen West Side Story, you know exactly who I'm talking about. So she's literally a trailing spouse in West Side Story. That's the character she's playing. And guess what Kathy is? She's a trailing spouse. Her spouse is way more successful than she is. I also think that there's an interesting story there as far as like, a connection as well is is the end of West Side Story, the main love story, not the story that Kathy is playing within it, but the main love story, the man dies in the end. It's the woman. So it, like there is a le- there is a feeling of left and abandonment towards the end. So we see this first, like that's a hint towards it. Even though Kathy isn't necessarily playing Maria, the fact that that ends in tragedy and abandonment and grief, and we know that 
Kathy's story has already ended in abandonment and grief. It, it, the subtleties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the and absolute subtleties. And it's so interesting. And I, I just, I just love the part how like we see Kathy through her art because it's so important to her and Jamie's art is already successful. And so we barely ever hear about it. We hear, we see Jamie's with his relationship with other people. Yeah. Which is a fascinating thing because we don't get to see the other sides of those conversations, Mm -hmm. but we see it with him hearing about his instant success from the book editor who wants to come in and publish his novel. We see it about his struggle with keeping like his struggle with women after they get married. Uh, There's a whole song about Jamie talking about like, if only there were, if only we could disappear and there was only two of us, because it seems as soon as you get married, every single woman wants to sleep with you. Like that's literally the, the key of it. Of Jamie like, don't know how oh, to tell a woman. No, he don't know how no, to tell a woman. No, he never tell... learned and he doesn't want to learn. <laughs> and, but, and he, but he does for a while. Like that's the other thing too, is that he does yeah. for a while until he doesn't. Until Kathy has pushed him away so much emotionally and has blamed him so much for her own failure that he has like this need to be important to somebody else. Like, I think that that's the, the like, they're so, both of these characters are so insecure of who they are. It's just that Jamie is being fed and Kathy is being starved. That the only person who's feeding Kathy is Jamie and that's not enough. And then eventually Jamie stops feeding her and she gets starved. Okay. So, like, so, yeah. so who's right? Who's wrong? I, I think it is no, no surprise to you that um, we both lean towards team Jamie. I definitely lean towards team Jamie. Um, I was team cat. Cause I, this was the first time I had watched this, right. was for this show. So I was team Kathy in the very beginning, like for the first couple of songs And then when I realize that, oh, the reason why Jamie is doing this to her is because she doesn't support his success. She resents his success. Well, after that, I'm kind of all team Jamie, to be honest, because like it's not Jamie's fault that Kathy isn't successful. He really has nothing to do with it. Jamie got lucky and Kathy didn't. And that's no one's fault. That's just how life worked out. And yes, it does suck for Kathy. But she straight up takes it out on him. She really does. Mm-hmm. Um, she blames him for it. She expects him to fix it. And she does expect him to fail to make her feel comfortable. Like, he's not wrong when he says that. And her reaction is pretty extreme. Um, she, like, slams the door. She's, like, very angry. You know, they they go to bed angry. They get up the next morning angry. Like, it's, like, that kind of uh, anger. But, like, Jamie's right. He's right. And I can't help but start to sympathize with him. And then, of course, like I see that the cheating is very literal, like he has literal girlfriends. He's not just sleeping around. It's not just once or twice. It's no, he literally does have this other girlfriend that he keeps during the summers while Kathy's away. And Um, I don't I don't think it's a girl. I don't even think it's a girlfriend. Like, I think it's just women. I think it's a bunch of women because we see over. We see different women and it's over and over and it is constant, but it is like, I don't, I think that Kathy at this point in time is still the only significant relationship that is consistent in his life. But we don't know. We don't really know. I was, he is certainly having a person. I was under the impression that no, there are some of these girlfriends that he's closer to because a line in his song says like, you know, we're just, we're just pretending that my life isn't really. Yeah. So I don't know. I think some of some of these this girlfriend situation is a little bit more serious than he thinks it is. I think that there are affairs happening, but I don't think necessarily he's in love with them. Oh no! I, I think he's that it's necessarily in love. I think at this point he's still trying for Kathy. Like there, he hasn't given up at that point. Uh, I very quickly wanted to go back to that line that we were talking about that you like that she, he accuses her of. Uh, slamming the door and this was the line or that accuses her of of wanting him to fail and she slams the door and this is the line that really changed 
Jamie's perspective of me was that he says there is, I will not fail for you to be comfortable, Kathy. I will not lose because you can't win. She slams the door and he goes, if I didn't believe in you, and this is where the trouble all ends, if I didn't believe in you, I wouldn't have married you in front of all of our friends. And like, so it is this like idea of he is pouring everything he can into wanting her to succeed. And she will not give up and she will not see it. And she cannot change and is and has grown stagnant. And he, as he continues to grow. And that for me was like the line that I was like, wow, Jamie, Jamie is outgrowing her. Yeah. And she can't handle it. Yep. Because the thing is, is like someone's got to make the money, right? So yeah. if you want this relationship to work out, the only way it's going to work out is if Kathy decides to give up on her dreams and literally just be a trailing spouse that follows him. Unfortunately, in both, you know, 2001 when the play was written and in 2014 when the the musical came out, there was no um, Twitch streaming. Um, You know, YouTube was very small. So like, I mean, today, if this happened today, I would say Kathy could just become a YouTuber. You could just become a Twitch streamer. (laughs) Or like, or like change your plans. How many people have gone to New York City Mm -hmm. find a dream have not failed that dream but have realized that they can have a different dream yeah and she but she won't she refuses and she won't her her sight of what growth looks like is so determined on no i will not fail i will not fail i will not fail and that is what's causing her to fail her lack of willingness to take other jobs other than the ones that she's applying for. Her lack of willingness to see that, like, Ohio is a possibility to, like, expand. Mm-hmm. But she's not willing to consider that because that's low tier for her. Mm-hmm. Like, there is so much, there's so much stubbornness that comes with her that it really is a huge fault in the relationship, even though, I will say, she is the she she what jamie does is not right i don't want to sit there and say it like oh it's okay (laughs) that jamie cheated it's not okay that jamie cheated it's not it wasn't right it was not good no bueno jamie jamie did wrong but so did kathy and i think that like because infidelity is so outwardly wrong and so loud in its wrongness and the lack of growth and betrayal of like those vows of growing together and being with each other in sickness and in health is so more subtle that Kathy looks the victim. But she's really not. She really created the situation where he kind of didn't have a choice. Even if he didn't actually cheat, he still would have like emotionally disconnected from her no matter what. Um, mm-hmm. And when I was watching this and she she accuses him of cheating and we learn in the very beginning that he has cheated on her, I didn't believe it. So I I legitimately thought like because that was it was at that point that I was starting to see that like Kathy's kind of like really stubborn and, and annoying and maybe I'm more team Jamie. So I thought like, yeah. well, maybe she it's- didn't really cheat. Maybe she's overreacting. <laughs> and so you find out later, like the cheating is made explicit and clear to where you can't deny it. And I was like, dang it, Jamie, really? Really? You yeah. actually did the heck? Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting because it is that like level of, it, it's a beautiful, it's again, there isn't a bad song on this album, but it's the second of Kathy's songs and they're in Ohio together. Obviously near the end of the relationship, this is like the first song is Kathy has been left. Ohio, this is the song right after that. So at the very, very like end of their relationship and Kathy is like trying to make it work being like, hey, you visited me in Ohio. And and Jamie is like also trying, but then he's like, yeah, I actually have like a party that I have to go to. So I have to go back to the city and she gets angry at that. And then he, and then like the visceral, like accusatory of like, oh, I guess you could go hang out with your little girlfriends uh, starts. And it, it is that like that jealousy anger monster that takes over at the end of a relationship. And it's, it's a really interesting 
way of seeing it because you're like, okay, Kathy, you're overreacting. This man has a meeting to go to. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. I was like, Kathy, he's telling you he has to go go to a meeting. Like, I know it's annoying to have to go do social events with your coworkers. I agree that it is. But if you want to, you know, grow your career, you have to go do the stupid social events with your coworkers. And so like at that moment is where I was starting to be like more team Jamie. And I was yeah. like, you know, she's accusing him of cheating. And like at that moment, I was like, well, maybe he is. But it's like, it's probably not that bad. She's probably just, you know, jealous and annoying. No, he's like, he's like literally got girlfriends that he's bringing yeah, home he's, while she's in Ohio. It's it's not good. He's not no. good. <laughs> and but and like, you, get it, I, you get that big clue. You get told, you get told at the beginning of the musical that by age 23, he somehow well, had 12 relationships already. Yes. And, and here's the other thing too, is that like, I never doubted the cheating. I figured, yeah, no, there's probably been affairs. Like that's why they're here. There have most definitely been affairs, especially when we hear the song about how he can't say no like that he's struggling with saying no to women who are hitting on him. Um, <laughs> and so I'm like, oh yeah, no, he definitely cheated. I think what's interesting is how the story like changes your perspective on that ultimate betrayal because you realize that he's not the only one who betrayed. And I think that like that's who is right. There is no right. Right? Like that's at the end of the day, there is no right. This relationship was wrong. It was wrong for both of them. Right time, it should have ended sooner. Yeah. It didn't. Yeah. Really, like, and the only way to make this right is if that moment where Jamie realized that he was going to cheat, because it's it, it's really clear when he realizes, like, this is an eventuality that's going to happen. Like, he makes it very explicit that it's going to happen. He should have broken up with her then, but he didn't. Or... Or that he, or like that they had communicated. Like, mm -hmm. like that's the other thing too, is this is a story of miscommunication down to the very beat of it, of like, if they had communicated, if if Kathy had been honest with the mm -hmm. like, oh, I am so hurt that you're successful. Like, and they could have had that conversation right at the front of it where it's like, well, I'm not going to lose because you can't win. That would have been able to be heard if there was less hurt involved or if there was less anger at that point, um, having those communications and, and the reality is like, that's another reason why this is so relatable is because the could have, should have, would have of a relationship can go over and over and over and over again. But at the end of the day, this is how a relationship falls apart. Yep. You could have communicated earlier. Sure. But you didn't which means that at the end, it's messy. At the end, someone leaves. And at the end, someone is holding on. Yep. Yep. But ultimately, I think that what we learned at the very beginning about how Jamie said, you know, no more therapy, I'm just leaving. Ultimately, I think he's right. I don't think a therapist could have fixed this no, at there's... all because the only way to fix it would have been to totally change who Kathy is. And she's not and interested he... in changing. And who he is, too. Mm -hmm. Because, like, let's be honest, he's also not interested in changing. He's not. He's, he's not interested. Why? And here's the deal, too. Why would he? He, he shouldn't. He's successful. <laughs> yeah. He's successful. He's getting everything he wanted. Mm -hmm. He doesn't feel like he needs to be fulfilled by this relationship because he's being fulfilled by other relationships. Mm -hmm. There is no reason for Jamie to change. Kathy has all the reasons to change because she is miserable. But then again, people who are miserable also find it just as hard to change as people yep. who are thrilled. She still doesn't want to. And if you don't want no. to, no amount of therapy is going to do anything for you. Yeah. This is this is a this is two people who were good together and then weren't. Mm -hmm. And that happens so often. Yep. And that's okay. No one is right. The right move was to leave. Oh, that's so good. This movie is so good. <laughs> it's a good musical. I'm so glad you liked it. Like that was like, it, this is like, again, there's like levels of like stories that I'm just like, oh, I hope the people that I show like this thing that I really, <laughs> really watch. And it's so close to my heart because every single song in this is relatable. I get ev like every person I, I understand. And so it's like so fun when you share that piece of joy with somebody and they're like, oh, I get this too. No, like as soon as, as soon as it was over, I was like, yep, I know why yeah. this is Landon's favorite. This is, I, don't I know get that this. I, I guess, well, maybe we should go to the next, next, what, is, what comes yeah. next? Is it? I think it's just, okay, does, does it, it resonate? resonate? Okay. So 
um, this is kind of continuing what I was saying before. So as soon as I was done with watching this, I was like, hmm, I see why this is Landon's favorite. I'm not sure I would call it a favorite of mine um, because I like things a little bit more campy and tropey. And this is a little bit too realistic to be a favorite. A little too indie. But yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit too. It's a little bit too like, oh, I've been there. I've had I've been there exactly. Um, but because of that, if we're asking, like, does it resonate? Oh, my God. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Super. This is probably out of everything that we've watched and everything that we have read, the most resonating thing ever. <laughs> yes. Um, I think anyone can relate to this. Yeah. Anyone. I I think that, like, I just love, I love stories and art that makes you question. Oh, sorry. That was an accident. Makes you question who you are and where you are in the world, which is what this story does, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, it makes us question, like, the relationships around you. If you if you feel something in the when watching this about like being like, oh, this is really close to me and my partner. Just saying, maybe you, you should might, you might want to examine explore that, that uh, <laughs> because because it's so real and it's so accurate. And like the only the only other thing that I can like relate this to is, uh, have you ever seen Daniel Sloss's comedy? No. Okay. Well, I'm gonna make you watch Daniel Sauce's stand up comedy. That would okay. be amazing if we could critique a video stand up maybe comedy. Maybe I just don't know his name. Let me let me look up what he looks like. No, it's fine. He has amazing specials, but he has this whole idea of like relationships and why people are in relationships. And it just makes you like sit and think for a second. And I love artwork that makes you do that. And mm. this does that. So not only does it feel like one of the reasons why it's my favorite is because it like hits that place in my like brain that just loves that shit but it also makes me feel like oh yeah this is familiar i've been on both sides of these things okay yeah no this i have not seen this guy but um Karen. i see that he has two netflix specials two netflix, netflix stand-up specials actually those are the two that you need to watch okay it's called dark <laughs> everybody and jigsaw. Who's, yeah everybody who's watching this jigsaw dark is great uh jigsaw changed my life oh okay uh, okay. and he has a tally he's watched jigsaws and he has a tally spreadsheet of how many divorces jigsaw has caused wow yeah it's fantastic okay all right it's so good <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately i know this is your favorite musical but just to make it yes. official landon does this resonate? oh yeah it resonates absolutely it's yeah. it speaks i am both these characters i have been both these characters i will be both these characters at some point in time and this relationship has happened and will happen and might currently be happening without me knowing it yeah and because you don't know until it's too late a lot of times yep so communicate and early communicate go to therapy early realize yeah. that you can't control the other people around you, you can only control how you feel about a situation. Maybe, maybe adjust your expectations of yourself and your friends oh and your God. Partner. Also, don't be so stubborn that five years later, you are still failing at the same thing you were failing at five years ago. Yeah, like maybe, <laughs> maybe if you're still <laughs> failing at your career, a career change would be good. <laughs> There's nothing wrong. It doesn't even have to be a career change. It could be a career shift. Hey, costume designers. She could, that would have been acting and a seamstress. Mm-hmm. But she didn't really go for that. She was trying to kind of really pursue the acting hardcore. Yes. Yeah. She could have shifted though. <laughs> yep. So. All um, right. So yeah. Okay. We're ending really early, but that's because this is a pretty simple thing. And it's okay because we did a media dive last week. So yeah. let's talk about where you can find us. Okay. So um, right after we finish here, uh, I am going to be playing some more of our Sims 2 Legacy. So we're going to be doing some more of that today. Did Tomorrow, I die yet? No, you're still alive. You're, <sighs> you're very Christ. old. You're very <laughs> old, but you're still alive. Um, <laughs> uh, I will tell you, your, your adopted daughter with your sugar baby, that girl, she's got D's in school because all she ever wants to do is party. So um, that's uh, like, that's somebody that you're that? leaving behind. And uh, your yeah. your daughter, Lily, did pass away. Poor thing. Wow. Um, satellite accident. Gotcha. She was crushed. Uh, but your your son's killing it. Your son's got a wife. He's got a he's got a kid and he's got another one on the way. I knew he was my favorite. 
Mm -hmm. He's doing great. Tormund's awesome. (laughs) Um. I'm going to say this for Landon. Tormund, my favorite. Mm. He's my favorite. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The other one died and the other one can't get anything above a D in school. Yeah, we'll see how she does. She's definitely not going to college. I don't see it. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with her. Um, And then tomorrow, we're going to be continuing our Majora's Mask playthrough. We're going to be taking on the Woodfall Temple tomorrow. So tune back in at noon um, right here for that. Uh, Next week on Interstage Window, we're having a community day, you guys. So we're going to be playing some Stardew. So you want to come back and hang out here with us where we continue our Stardew form. We're still on year one. We're going to be doing our first Spirits Eve. So I'm very excited for that. Um, Also, as you guys know, all of my VODs, go up on YouTube. So if you want to catch up on anything that um, that we've talked about in the past, you can go check out my YouTube. They are all there. I keep them all. Uh, also, my main social media is Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter to see all the updates for what's going on with stream. And if you would like to join my Discord to hang out with me or get uh, reliable notifications, you can do that as well. That's all the places to find me. So Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me at TikTok and Instagram at Land in Maine. Uh, my school, my class is bullying me into making teacher TikTok, so that might happen soon. So, like, uh, so they're actually have... wa- they're watching your TikToks now too, right? They have found my TikTok. I'm no longer blocking my TikTok. I've taken all the spicy stuff off and put it on friends only. And then I told them that if they comment or if they try to be my friend, I block them. So they're just they're just low key stalking me at this point. Well, you, I think uh, like you can't avoid it, right? Like TikTok knows yeah, who you no, know in no, no, real no. life and who's it knows who you know in real well, life. Yeah. It shows videos to the people who are around you. Like it's at it, this point when they when it happened last year, I was like really freaked out by it, especially because I had like thirst traps and stuff on that, and I was like, I. I hate this uh but at this point now i'm just like why should i stop doing things that bring me joy when i can you know do fun things right. so and you can still post the thirst traps and just mark them friends only and yes. that way you can and that's it. and that's kind of what i'm doing if i want to do a thirst trap i will mark it friends only um i've gone through my the people that i follow and everything like that i'm curating that and then i'm like maybe i'll start doing teacher tiktok stuff because i have a lot to say um Those are very so you can popular. find me there it is it's very fun uh and then you can also find me on twitter i'm sometimes there i'm mostly just lurking at this point uh woohoo <laughs> <laughs> landon's not invested in twitter thank god because elon is trying to kill it you know so i don't need, I don't need that shit <laughs> yep. um okay so if you would like to support us you can of course um do audible like we talked about earlier i'll put that link back up audible as well um you can also do all the twitch things so if you liked today's stream please give us a follow if you really like today's stream you can subscribe you can donate i have a tip jar um i have a throne wish list so that you can give me gifts privately if you'd like to do that as well as a merch store if you're interested in that sort of thing so that's all the ways that you can support us um but really We just love having you here hanging out. So following is enough. Um, And that's it. That's our that's our show for today. Our next one that we're actually going to be doing a uh, media episode on is going to be um, Snowpiercer. Okay, so we whet your appetite for some romance with this one. We're going to whet your appetite for some dystopia with that one. Um, And that's all going to be precursors for talking about the Hunger Games in March. So get excited. That's what's coming next for our podcast episodes. Yes, it's going to be a yes. blast. Yes. Um, Yeah, that's all you got for me this day. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, And for YouTube, of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>